Hello, everyone. I'm Ankan Mukherjee. And uh, there's Arnab Ghost right here. Uh, this talk is about running stateful services on Mesos, what we did at Moz, and what we learned. And we're hoping to share it with you and uh, for the common good. Um, Arnav's right there. We'll, I'll go through this. And then if we have questions, one of us will answer those. So let's start. So let's start with um, a typical deployment diagram that many of us may have seen. So we have some sort of a uh, deployment diagram here. I just took it off the Wikipedia. So what it shows is that there are a bunch of different applications, components, some services that are on specific servers, and they're all working together for one big application. So nothing uh, entirely different from what you may have already seen. And together, they are essentially one huge application. And there are other similar applications that are out there in the enterprise. And then each component or each service within the application actually gets deployed to one or more nodes. And then finally, we have something that is much like this, which is a whole bunch of servers across the enterprise, uh, very heterogeneous. Sometimes they are shared, but, but more often they are not shared across projects and across applications. So what we have with Mesos, on the other hand, is some, something like this. We have a set of services or tasks or processes which fulfill a bunch of business needs. And then they can be run on many different nodes, uh, irrespective of which node it is. Ideally, they're completely decoupled. And we get some really good operational advantages. We get automatic failover. It's a lot easier to manage and maintain the nodes. And it's a lot easier to manage, version manage, and maintain the applications outside of uh, the nodes. And it's easier to stage it. It's easier to move to prod. Uh, and overall, we get lesser complexity of the whole set of systems. All right. So given that, we would obviously want to transition onto Mesos, right? That's what, that's, what, that's what we would want, because that's the gain we are looking for. So if we do this, what sort of challenges do we actually face? So there are three major challenges that we would typically face if we are looking for moving a traditional application that is deployed onto one or more servers into the Mesos uh, uh, environment. There's packaging and deployment. Docker often solves this problem. Uh, there's naming and finding services. Uh, there's you know, there's uh, Mesos DNS. There's Bamboo. There's certain, uh, certain ways to solve that problem. And then there's the dependency on persistent state. So all of us know that stateless processes, processes are very easy to move from one node to another, obviously, for obvious reasons. But as soon as we are talking about an application that actually depends on local uh, storage, we run into some issues. So we are talking about applications that are um, dependent on local storage, that depend on data they have written right then. And if that data goes away, the application would essentially not be functioning. And that's what we are really focused on in this talk. So uh, the problem is that we could have in Mesos a scenario something like this. So let's say we have a bunch of nodes, and we have this process running on one of the nodes. For some reason, the node goes away. It may come back later on, or it may just not come back. Either way, what we have with Mesos is the framework that is working with you would essentially start it back up onto a different node. So I'm just going to say that Mesos is going to start it onto a different node just for brevity. So that's great for stateless processes. But for any process that actually depends on storage, we obviously have a problem here. So examples of these processes are legacy apps, uh, single node databases, you know, MySQL, Postgres, and so on. And apps, essentially apps that depend on local storage. 
So what are the potential solutions? So we're just going through some of these, and we'll elaborate on all of these. So we have, uh, we can obviously use, uh, continue to use local storage, and if we do so, we'll, we'll obviously run into some challenges, and we'll look at what we can do to uh, take care of those. Uh, and of course, we could use shared storage, which I'm sure many of you would have already done if you, are, if you have faced problems similar to what you're talking about. Then there's the network block device. And then there are some new features like the Mesos persistent resource primitives that could make it a lot easier. And uh, if all else fails, we, we look at application-specific distributed systems. All right, so moving on. Let's start with the local storage. So with local storage, option one, we are looking at simply pinning the process to the node, to a particular node. So what that means is as long as this node is available, the process will be available. And we're talking about single node applications just for uh, the ease of understanding here. But essentially, the moment this server dies, your application is no longer available. This is akin to what you might have you know, in um, non-Mesos deployments, where you might have an application that you are running on a server, and if it goes down, you'll have to manually intervene and figure out what's wrong, and then bring that up. So with that, uh, what does that mean? So obviously, we have a huge advantage that we don't really have to make any changes to the app application as such. The process continues to run as was. We just move it to Mesos. and uh, we really not, don't gain much from a process standpoint. It continues to run on the same node or, or a particular node. Um, but the gain we have is now that this node is part of your Mesos, framework, uh, Mesos cluster, uh, unused resources in this node can actually be used for other processes. So there's a little bit of gain. Uh, obviously, that, that's something we can live with for now. And then the cons, of course, are that you don't get much of the operational efficiency that you get with uh, advantages that you get with Mesos. No failover. Uh, services are still sort of coupled to the node, although you might still want to decouple it you know, using something like Docker just to make it easier, but you still are sort of tied to the node. And uh, it sort of feels like cheating. So now, now let's move, move on to the next uh, 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 option with local storage. So with this, what we do is, OK, we don't want to pin the, no uh, pin the service to a node. What we want to do is we want to do something else, which is we want to just take periodic backup of the data we have. Now, how we take that backup depends on the application itself. But essentially, we have some central uh, storage somewhere out there. And uh, we essentially just backup data every now and then. When that happens, what it also means is uh, when the process comes up over here, before the process starts, we also have to ensure that we restore that data back into this node. This has to happen before the process starts. So when Mesos figures out that this node has gone away, it will actually start the process. But we have to intervene and make sure that we actually get the data in into this node and then proceed from there. OK, so the big question is where, when and where to backup. So the answer to this is it's, there is no uh, set rule here. You can just backup to any central location from which uh, you can actually restore to all of your other nodes. It can be any sort of backup. Um, when and where to restore, uh, <clears throat> obviously, you don't know beforehand when the node go fails. You don't know beforehand where, where the backup is, and you don't know where, uh, uh, which backup is the latest one. So obviously, the only point you know all of these is when the process actually starts. So that's exactly when you back, uh, restore. So we are essentially talking about an automated scripted restore at process start. So anytime the process starts, you would need to intervene, uh, probably have a script that figures out which backup to take, and then uh, restores it to this node before moving on to the actual uh, process or the actual startup script. So with this, we have some more pros. We are now gaining automatic failover to a great extent because uh, systems can pretty much uh, uh, fail over to a different node and start up immediately. You don't need manual intervention. At least you don't need an urgent manual intervention. At some point, you might want to figure out what happened to that node. Uh, and of course, you get, uh, get to share, share your resources just like uh, earlier. Um, and you have, uh, uh, and, and it's pr fairly easy to set up. It's easy to set up because we are not really making major changes here. We are talking about, uh, about 
backing up to some place which you probably already have in your current system. And the only thing you're talking about is restoring it, which you probably already have some script for anyway. Uh, cons, so there's a little, there may be a little bit of uh, complexity with restoring. You, you, you'll probably have to take into account that uh, something might fail even during backup. So there's a little bit of figuring out to do, make sure that you actually take a good backup and not a bad backup. And, but those are things you can handle easily. Um, you may be adversely affected by this type of data and the volume of data. If you're talking about lots of volume of data, uh, it'll obviously affect the time to restore. So that's something that could be a disadvantage. And uh, most importantly, we are talking about a data loss. So what happens is any data that was added to the system between the last backup and when the node failed is essentially lost in this process. So that's, uh, that's, that's obviously a big disadvantage. But if you can live with that, then so be it. Moving on. So that was about local storage. So now let's talk about shared storage. So with the shared storage, what we are talking about is instead of uh, uh, storing in a local disk, we just use a POSIX compliant shared file system, something like NFS, and make sure that they are mounted to the same point on all of your nodes, or all of your nodes where you want to run this processes, uh, run this process. So with that in place, you have a much better situation. The node goes away, MISO starts the process in a different node, and you don't have to worry about restoring data because that node already has access to that same data. Now, obviously, you would have to make sure that you mount it on, on the same uh, point. So that looks very promising. Um, so great, right? So can anything go wrong? So to answer that question, let's see what we just did. We took a process that's supposed to be running on one machine, having complete access to a local storage, and we kind of separate them, separated them away and put a network right in between. So obviously, there are things that can go wrong. So let's look at that a little bit in more detail. So let's now talk about uh, what happens with MISO. So you, you have a master. Uh, let's say this is the master, and there are, those are fallbacks. And then you have these nodes. So at any point, let's say your compute node because that's what it's doing any, uh, now on, just gets disconnected from the master. So at this point, what Mesos would do is it would figure out, hey, this node is gone. I need to restart this process somewhere else. It could actually start it on a different node. The moment it does that, you end up with the same process accessing the same data in two, two different nodes, which is a problem because we are talking about systems that are not built to handle these kind of scenarios. So you could end up with data corruption if you're writing any data. And the assumption is that you're writing data. If you're reading data, then you probably don't worry too much about all this. Um, uh, if you're only reading data, there are other issues you may need to worry about. For instance, you, there is no way for you to know for sure that this process gets killed ever. So you know that could cause some trouble if there are other uh, clients that are accessing this, and so on and so forth. But the big problem here is that data corruption hap can happen. OK? So given that. Uh, so that's one problem. Now let's look at another situation. Let's, a node, let's say the node actually disconnects from the network and after a while comes back in. Uh, that is again something that happens all the time. And in this scenario, what happens is Mesos again figures out that, hey, this node has gone away. Let's start the process elsewhere. And that's great. Until this point, we are fine. No issues. However, the moment the node comes back, because this process was really not killed, and uh, you, you end up with a situation where this process, as well as this process, both of them, both these tasks essentially write to the same location. And that could, again, cause data corruption. And uh, thirdly, you could have a situation where someone accidentally scales your process. Now, you would obviously not want to do that. But if that happens, you don't want your system to just start corrupting data, right? So this is something that could also cause trouble. Because you're talking about Mesos, uh, and these frameworks allow you to scale to many, many number of tasks, you could always move to a situation where this task, which is supposed to be just one, uh, is scaled to more than one. Um, so given that, so these were issues uh, related to uh, what uh, data corruption. Now, there is another issue, which is sort of better in the sense that it doesn't cause data corruption, that, but it could still be a problem. 
let's say instead of disconnecting from the master, the node simply got disconnected from the network on the, on the file share side. So if it got disconnected from the file share, you have a situation where the process is running, Mesos thinks everything is hunky-dory, it doesn't do anything about it, and uh, you have a situation where your application, uh, let's, say, let's say if it's a MySQL DB, you're suddenly, uh, it doesn't have any data anymore. Now, depending on how the application is built, it may just you know, spew out errors or it may just exit, but there's a good chance that you have a situation which is undesirable. You have an application that, that doesn't have its data and it's still running. All right. So given that, uh, we, this is just a summary of what can go, go wrong. I think we covered it pretty in detail, so let's, let's move on. Uh, so the node disconnects from the master, the node disconnects from the network, some other task is scaled up, and the node disconnects from the file share. All right. So how, how can you fix it? Um, to answer that question, uh, all you have to do is uh, figure out how do, we do, how do we fix it in, in a typical distributed system. And the answer is by using mutual exclusion. So what we would really want to do is use something like Zookeeper. It could be Zookeeper or etcd or something that can essentially allow you to create a distributed lock which is mutually exclusive. So what you would want is, when the process starts, the process should latch onto that lock. It should work with Zookeeper and get a lock. If it gets a lock, great, it can proceed. If it doesn't get a lock, it should just exit out. Also, even if it gets a lock and continues running, at any point it loses the lock, it should also exit out immediately. If you can make sure that happens, you will ensure that you always have one process across your network, across your distributed system, which uh, is running and accessing your data. Also, this process would uh, check the file share and exit out in case it loses connection to the file share itself. So that's great in theory. Uh, how do we do that? Are we talking about rewriting the process completely? Uh, because obviously, the, the system currently doesn't do this. Uh, the answer is pretty simple. We just add a wrapper around the actual application, and what we do is this wrapper, which could be a script or an app, a simple application, would actually take care of this. So what you do is this wrapper is essentially talking to Z Zookeeper as well as the file share and ensuring that, confirming that it has the lock and it continues to hold the lock. Any point, any time it loses the lock, it would just kill the process. It will start the process as its child process, so it can actually kill the process and then exit out. So with this in place, you are actually have a situation that can take care of all these issues. Because now what happens is it doesn't matter whether any of your node disconnects from any of your system. Any time it disconnects from, any time it has actual lock, it will continue to run. Now, you could have some scenarios where it can use to hold on the lock, to, uh, lock on the zookeeper, but it's disconnected from other systems. And those are typically things you would have to worry about. But you at least don't run into the data corruption issue that could cause havoc. Uh, so that was shared uh, file system, which is centralized. And uh, pros, it's still easy to set up. Because uh, if you really look at what we did, we just mounted a common point across all our nodes. And we wrote a simple wrapper application that took care of mutual exclusive locks and checking with the file server. Now, both of these are fairly easy to do. In fact, uh, mutual exclusive lock is, you know, is one of the example codes in Zookeeper or Curator. Uh, so it's fairly easy to actually set it up on your system. Uh, and we actually get most of the advantages that we would want with Mesos. Uh, you get automatic failover pretty much instantaneously. You don't have to worry about restore, backup, and all that. I mean, you do have to worry about backup, but let's come, come to that later on. But you don't have to restore before you restart the process. Um, and uh, of course, you don't get to scale, because your system is not really built for that. Um, cons, uh, there is a little bit of mutual exclusion related code, but that's OK. And of course, the other uh, disadvantage is we now brought the network in between. So we are very much dependent on the speed and the latency. All right. Now. Given that, let's move to another uh, 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 option, which is a distributed shared file system. So this is pretty much uh, similar 
we are talking about POSIX compliant distributed file system, something like um, uh, GlusterFS or MooseFS or Luster. Uh, essentially, we would want to mount it just like any uh, f uh, file system and have the process continue to run. So from a process standpoint, this is exactly the same as what we just talked about, a centralized file system. The only difference is that the implementation is obviously different. So you don't have a central file system anywhere. Uh, the files are actually within these nodes. And you know, uh, as long as you implement one of these, you are probably set. So given this, what does that mean? Now, all of the pros that we just talked about still hold true. All of the cons completely hold true as well. As uh, it's just like centralized file system, the only difference is that uh, we do have to manage the uh, setting up of the distributed file system. Now, if you already have something that you're using for other processes or other tasks out there, then, then you're good to go. Otherwise, you do have to ma uh, maintain it, set up, and you have to also uh, worry about how the data gets distributed across the nodes, what's the replication, and so on and so forth. So that is something that you have to worry about. All right, so I think we talked about all of these systems which essentially allow you to uh, take care of um, uh, uh, using a shared file system. Let's move to a different uh, solution. And this is a network block device. So a network block device or NBD is simply a block device which is available across the network. One advantage with a network block device is that you typically get a little better performance because we are talking about instead of working at a file level, we are now talking at in, uh, talking in the block level. So that could be one reason why you might want to use it. And uh, keep in mind that with a network block device, you don't get to mount it on multiple nodes. That's uh, that can simply cause data corruption just by mounting it to multiple nodes and having. Uh, all of them read write data, uh, obviously because it doesn't handle all that. So what we have is something like this, wherein if this process actually fails, or uh, this node fails, and the process comes up in a different node, you would want to just make sure that the same device is mounted to that node. So it's sort of, uh, it's somewhere, it looks somewhere in between the local device and the shared file system. So you still have to worry about mounting it and before the process starts. So just like in the local disk, what you would do is uh, as soon as MISO starts the process, you would want to just make sure you have, it, you have the block device mounted. Uh, you may need to repair, because we are talking about block devices here, you may need to run um, uh, a, rep a repair on the block device before it actually uh, before the process actually starts. All right, so uh, the advantage here is you typically would probably have a lesser overhead than something like an NFS or any uh, system that actually works at a file level. Uh, and we are talking about POSIX compliant systems here. And cons is, of course, it's slightly more difficult to manage uh, because you're talking about mounting, remounting block devices across your nodes. And uh, failover is not exactly automatic. It, you will have to write some script, and then it will become automatic. And you may need to run, uh, elite, run some repair on the file system before uh, you can continue. OK. Uh, so those were some of the ways to actually uh, solve the problem. Now let's come to persistent state resource primitives. So this is something that is fairly new, and uh, I've not had a chance to use it. Uh, I just came out of the talk that was uh, before uh, around two. So this obviously makes it easier to manage your storage. You, you essentially are starting to use storage as a resource. Uh, so far, Mesos has not really been handling storage for you. So a lot of what we did was really uh, we would handle the storage, we would allocate, deallocate ourselves. But with this in place, it becomes easier to uh, take resource, create, you know, specific, you know, subdivide your data into uh, multiple persistent volumes. And uh, the other advantage is you actually uh, can set it up so that your task that depends on a particular set of data can actually restart on the same node where it was running last. So, 
That's something that was not possible so far. You had no guarantees that Mesos would start the process on the same node. But with persistent resource primitives, you could actually at least ensure that if that node doesn't completely go away, you would essentially have the process or the task start up on the same node, which actually makes it fairly easy to, uh, fairly advantageous to actually start using local disk um, to a greater extent. So that is about persistent state resource primitives. And if everything else fails, then we have uh, <clears throat> application-specific solutions. So for MySQL, for instance, we have, uh, I mean, there's Vitis, and then there's MySauce, which is actually you now Apache Cotton. Now, both of these are fairly well-proven and can actually manage your MySQL uh, database clusters, and that's great. Um, the advantage is it's pretty, uh, you know, it's actually built for these sort of uh, frameworks, which is great. It, you have availability, you have replication, it's highly scalable. The problem is that unless you're talking about something that is used across the industry and you already have a solution for it, you don't really have some, anything. We are essentially talking about just rewriting your system, uh, especially if you're talking about a custom application that's out there in the enterprise, you will have to essentially rewrite it. So if everything else fails, you probably want to, to do that. All right. So with this, this is a list of stateful services that we have run on Moz. Uh, we have run uh, following these same guidelines. We have mostly found that the shared file system worked pretty well for us, and uh, that's what I've been using. So we have had MySQL, Postgres, Postgres MongoDB, Redis, RethinkDB, and Elasticsearch. Uh, we did move Elasticsearch later on to a different node, but that was not because of uh, uh, Mesos, but because we, you, we wanted to use SSDs, and the nodes we are running Mesos on didn't have those. Um, now let's go, go to some best practices or lessons learned. So uh, one is mount your directory at the same point. So irrespective of whether you're using a local disk or shared disk, you would want to ensure that you have exactly the same mount point on your file system. If you don't do that, you could end up with situations where multiple set of data or subset of data end up in multiple at multiple locations. Uh, so with this in place, you would just have to make sure that your configuration, whatever you're using, so let's say if you're using Marathon, then uh, your JSON file has exactly the same mount point, and you don't have to change it. Mesos simply uses it and starts the process in a different node, and everything works fine. Uh, secondly, uh, now that you're talking about storage you, and you're really handling storage yourself, storage could actually be the single point of failure here. So if you lose data, you'd be in deep doo-doo, so to say. So what you would want to do is you want to have uh, multiple levels of backups. You want to have RAID at, at a disk level or something that will work for you. And you would also continue to have uh, backup at the application level, you know, be it MySQL, D, uh, dump or uh, MongoDB dump or whatever. Thirdly, you would want to use services like Zookeeper or HCD to actually uh, ensure mutual exclusion when needed. We just did that for the storage uh, portion that we talked about for shared file systems. And also, you would have to start looking at how does your how is your storage used? So you have to isolate your applications at, at this layer. So for instance, depending on disk space or usage, you might want to create different mount points or different NFS mounts for your applications. Uh, depending on the disk IOPS and your need, you would want to create different ones for those as well. And then depending on network bandwidth, you might want to isolate your applications you know, based on how your network is set up. So this is completely dependent on how uh, the system is set up at your end, and of course, uh, also what sort of data uh, usage you have. And last but not the least, you obviously have to ensure that you have uh, adequate monitoring in place because you are essentially handling storage. Mesos is not doing anything for you as far as data handling is, uh, the storage is concerned. It just uses the mount points that you give to it, and it just can use uh, working. With some of the new features, perhaps we'll get uh, some really good uh, 
uh, new features related to monitoring. But right now, you're all on your own as far as your disk monitoring goes, as long as you use this. All right, so with that, we come to the conclusion. And uh, essentially, what we're saying is, although it, is, it doesn't look like a natural fit, we can still actually have stateful applications running on Mesos, and we can actually have some advantages with that. And uh, secondly, we want to ensure that we approach the problem as an engineering problem. We specifically look at the application you're talking about. We understand what sort of storage needs there are, uh, how much read data does it, uh, how much uh, does it spend time to read data, how much time does it spend to write data, uh, what sort of volume of data does it use. And then depending on all that, and depending on what we are, you know, what we are happy with in terms of uh, speed and uh, uh, performance, we'll have to take a decision. So that's pretty much uh, what uh, I had. I'll, uh, we do have some charts we could share, but we, we, we would like to take some questions before that. If, and I don't know if, uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. A bit of a stupid question, but could you speak to a little bit to the advantages of running stateful services uh, through Mesos as opposed to just saying, hey, I've got my Cassandra cluster, I've got Postgres, whatever, I'm going to just cording them off from the realm of Mesos. Sure. So um, actually, uh, to do that, you could just look at the first slide. So we get some advantages with Mesos, which are sort of, uh, here. So if you look at what you get in a system like this, you essentially get automatic failover. It's easier to manage and maintain. Version management is much simpler, and so on. Uh, citing your examples, the minimum advantage that you would get is resources that are not being used in your machines are now actually available for other applications to use. So if you have, let's say, three nodes which are completely focused on supporting whatever application, say Cassandra or whatever it is you're using, there's a good chance that you're not really using 100% of the system resources, be it RAM or be it uh, CPU cycles or whatever it is, right? The moment you bring it into Mesos, that unused resource is actually available to the rest of your applications. So that's one huge advantage you get just by adding it to Mesos. Can you think of anything else, uh, Arno? So the other case where it's been really useful for us to, um, to be able to run these services in Mesos is actually setting up uh, dev environments. So typically what you want to be able to do is uh, be able to give the devs uh, the, the entire copy of the stack. This way what you can do is you can, like, you can have a copy of the stack per dev running on a shared cluster, on a shared set of resources, and uh, that, that allocation is very, very dynamic. So you can spin up a stack when you want it do a development, do a unit testing, whatever you want to do, and then you can basically uh, um, tear it down almost uh, pretty quickly. So it gives you a lot of flexibility for if, even if uh, it allows you, it requires you to do a bit of work up front. Yes. So, we don't have, uh, the question was, uh, are you using a distributed file system in your environment? We don't have it in, uh, uh, nothing production on it yet. Uh, but especially given the, the direction that uh, with dynamic reservations and persistent resource primitives in Mesos, I think we're going to see that use case come up really, really fast. Um, the advantage that you specifically get with something like Moose or Gluster um, is that you get the POSIX interface that you want, which is what you want for your legacy devices, and at the same time you're getting that um, kind of the, uh, a lot of the benefits of an actual distributed file system like Hadoop. Um, so the jury is still out there, um, but my if I had to take a guess, I would say pretty soon, especially as soon as these dynamic reservations and persistent resource primitives land and are stable in Mesos proper, we'll, we'll, we'll start having frameworks which allow you to run those. So you think persistent volumes are going to make these problems go away? They're not going to make it go away. They're going to make it 
a little bit easier uh, because what you could do then is actually you don't have to. Um, the the biggest problem with the with the shared, central shared um, storage systems is that they start becoming a single point of failure. So as Duncan said, you have to really make sure you go to heroic lens to make sure that you still have the availability. Now, granted, those are you are typically running it on a on a high availability appliance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, network failures, rack failures, all of these can can really hose you. So, the advantage you're going to get with uh, with something like a POSIX compliant distributed file system is that um, you start getting a lot of benefits of actually having that abstraction be spread over a bunch of machines and replication happening automatically. Any questions? No. Okay. Cool. So, right. Uh, here, sort of, we just have five more minutes. So, if there are no more questions, I think we're good for the talk. All right. Thank you.